So jumping right into greenhouse management, I call this section locating a greenhouse. And there's a corresponding chapter in the text. And one of the challenges of locating a greenhouse, and I'm taking this from the, from the perspective is that you're going to go out and buy a piece of property and build a greenhouse. But uh, more often than not, you're going to go buy a piece of land that already has a greenhouse on it. So these are some of the things that you think about if you're locating a greenhouse. And there's a couple of things that I like to point out. The first one is trying to predict the land use. That is probably one of the biggest challenges we have because we have a lot of greenhouse nursery owners in this country that are multimillionaires because they built a greenhouse or nursery way out in the country, way out in urban lands, and urban sprawl has overtaken them and they've been able to sell that property for lots of money and build somewhere else. For instance, the Elich Gardens was located uh, in downtown Denver and Park Elich, when they sold their property, they moved to Fort Lupton and were able to build a very high-tech greenhouse. Uh, that's now Color Star Greenhouses um, in Fort Lupton, which is in business today. So one of the things is that you need to predict is what is urbanization going to do to you? How is it going to change the land use? How is it going to change your zoning? How is it going to change your tax base? Uh, are you going to have to comply with fire codes? setbacks, easements, etc. The other thing you need to think about are the microclimates. Of course we want to stay out of fog zones. We want to avoid topographic shadows and high winds like that's possible in Colorado. So with the microclimates, one of the first things we want to do is avoid sites that are prone to fog. If anybody has driven to Denver on I-25 from Fort Collins south when it's below zero and you pass through the, the um, Thompson River drainage or the St. Vrain River drainage, first thing you notice is you hit a fog bank. That's where the cold air has settled on those rivers and it's foggy. So you want to avoid the, the cold pockets. In this graphic on the right, you can see where cold air is going to fall, warm air is going to rise, and it's going to settle, and that becomes a potential uh, problem for heating and cooling of your greenhouse. Topographic shadows. Um, Glenwood Springs area is a good example where they have very steep uh, mountain sides in the valley and during the midwinter when the uh, sunlight, this angle of the sun is the lowest, you're going to have a lot of problems with a lot of shadows. You're not going to have as much sunlight during the day. But in addition to those topographic shadows, we need to think about trees, buildings, other things. They're going to cause shadows during the time of year when you need to get the most sunlight. Avoid areas that are prone to high winds. Building a greenhouse in the open plains of Wyoming, you're going to have high winds. When does the wind not blow in Wyoming? Um, so you want to avoid areas of wind acceleration, the, um, the Venturi effect. A lot of people aren't familiar with carburetors for engines anymore, but one of the things that a carburetor does is this orifice that squeezes down the air, and when the air is squeezed into a tighter volume, it speeds up. And that's something you want to avoid. And we, we call them, in urban climates, wind tunnels. And when the wind's blowing on campus and you're walking around campus, you can tell where the wind tunnels are in between which buildings. For instance, uh, there's going to be a major wind tunnel around uh, the library in Clark or between the library and Eddy Hall. Those are huge wind tunnels for the westerly winds. So you want to avoid areas like that. And finally, or not so finally, but one thing to really consider is the occurrence of hail. Hail does a big number on a greenhouse roof. Uh, it takes a size hailstone about the size of a softball to go through tempered plate glass, like a tempered plate glass greenhouse. That's the same uh, kind of material they use for storefront glass. It's designed to withstand a beer bottle. But uh, that's the same equivalent to that is a hailstone of about a softball. But if you have regular glass, it'll go right, uh, uh, marble size will go right through it. So you want to avoid hail. If you look at a map of Colorado where the greenhouses are located, you'll see that they're clustered. And typically they're clustered in hail free areas or areas that are not so likely to hail. Question in the back. How does wind affect the greenhouse? Um, 
What wind does, of course, is it does a couple things. If we have roof vents and you open into the roof, the wind will take the roof off. It has a tendency to peel back the roof if, if it gets under, the, she under the, the sheeting or something like that. But the most important thing that wind does is it strips energy away from the greenhouse structure itself. It speeds up the rate of heat transfer and makes it harder to heat. Excellent question. Another thing to think about when you're locating a greenhouse is where is your labor supply? What is your labor supply? If you look around Colorado, you'll see the biggest greenhouses are located in areas of the, uh, areas of the state that have a farm-based economy, farm-based labor. And what that means is you have people that are used to working hard. And they uh, are familiar with working with plants. They're familiar with working with agriculture. So you want to make sure that you have a steady labor supply and not somebody that's going to come to work work for four hours, cleaning up from underneath benches, pulling weeds, loading trays, stuff like this, and says, this work is too hard. I'd rather go get um, a job flipping burgers. That person that wants to flip burgers, they can go flip burgers. I want somebody that knows how to work. So you need to have a good economic stability and a good labor supply. You need to have ready access to sh receiving and shipping. Sometimes you'll, look at, you'll find good land with good water, with good site potential, and a gravel road with a bridge that a semi-tractor trailer can't cross. You're going to get deliveries of peat moss, potting soil, products like that, that require a certain amount of truck traffic that can take those bridges. And I'll tell you something, if you've got a delivery of peat moss coming, and it exceeds the weight limit of that bridge, and there's a sign on the bridge, the truck driver is going to offload on the other side of the bridge from where you want it because he or she is not going to cross that weight limit because if they break the bridge get stuck they're in trouble so you want to make sure that you have access to receiving and you have access to get trucks in and out during shipping season we ship usually if you're doing bedding plants you're usually shipping on Tuesday Tuesday and Wednesday so you can get your product into the garden centers on Thursday or Friday so they can offload for the weekend and it doesn't matter if it's raining, snowing, sleeting, or whatever. You need to get the trucks out. You need access to utilities. You have to have access to fuel, uh, access to power. Um, most greenhouses that are off grid are usually working for a small specialty market. And if you're a retail garden center, retail greenhouse, you need to have access to your customers. You want to be located in an area where your customers can get in and out. Um, Fort Collins Nursery is an example of a, of a facility that's relatively difficult to get in and out. It's on a frontage road. It's a challenge. Gullies, on the other hand, is on the right-hand side of the traffic going to Loveland. Bath greenhouses, they're on the opposite direction. So they all have their resident challenges that you need to think about if you're looking for retail market. Uh, when a box store comes into a community, Trust me, they look and see what direction the traffic goes to see where they want to locate their storefront. Water. When I talk to somebody that's wanting to start a greenhouse business, one of the first questions I ask them is, do you have water? Sometimes they'll say, well, there's a ditch running through my property. I will tap into that ditch. In Colorado, that may not work. You may not have the rights to that ditch, or the price that you have to pay for that ditch water is too expensive, or perhaps maybe that ditch water has come out of four or five farmers fields already and you don't want that water because no telling what kind of herbicides they're using or pesticides or fertilizers. If you're locating in a site that's got a well, it needs to be an agricultural well. And in Colorado, there's a thing called uh, the, the water laws that require you to replace water that you take out of a well. So you have to have the way to do a um, replenishment of the water that you use if you have that kind of a permit. It's called augmentation. Okay. So uh, sometimes that's a challenge. Question. Would a fully domesticated well work as well? 
Would a fully domesticated well work as well? Uh, it depends on what the well is permitted for. If it's a domestic well, it may be permit permitted for domestic use <coughs> and not agricultural use. That's where life gets challenging. And you would have to have an interpretation by an attorney or look at the permit to see how that water can be used. Now, if you're buying water from a, a domestic source or you're buying um, water from a provider, uh, that's a totally different story. They're taking care of the augmentation. You're just paying for that rate. One of the critical things about buying water is you need to get an agricultural rate and not pay a uh, business rate or a private rate. So you might be getting a source. So it's, it's something you need to do. And as a general rule of thumb, you need about 30,000 gallons of water a day per acre of greenhouses. Now that's for irrigation and evaporative cooling. And that's just a ballpark figure. Power in, uti in your utilities is really important. And utility systems for greenhouses, greenhouses use both uh, fossil fuels and electricity. Electricity for the fans, et cetera. And the ideal power to use in a greenhouse is what we call three-phase power. I'm not an electrician or an electrical engineer. But what three-phase power is, um, is you have extra, you have three legs of power coming into your property. What it is, is it uses it power more efficiently. The fan motors are more efficient. The fan motors uh, don't start as hard, don't start as, and they use uh, electricity at a lower amp load for the same amount of horsepower. So it's a more efficient power source. And the way you can tell when you're looking at a property is how many transformers it's got. Most, <coughs> most facilities have single phase power, like your apartment, your house, wherever you're living, you have single phase power. If you look at the, at the 220 volt um, system on the air conditioner, you'll see two hot leads and a neutral. This has got three hot leads and a neutral, something like that. Um, so we promote three phase power. It's not always available in, in rural locations. CSU works completely on three phase power. So uh, it's just more efficient, more industrial. Irrigation water. This is a, an example of a uh, agricultural well. Uh, this is actually a well in Florida. And the agricultural pump, it sits on, um, it's designed to sit on a, on a pad so that any wastewater that comes back, it's protecting the water supply so it doesn't flow back into the well and contaminate the well or contaminate your neighbor. Um, greenhouse water supplies need to be physically separated from domestic water sources. Uh, if you notice our water supply systems in our greenhouses on campus, if you wander around, you'll see drinking fountains and you'll see water spigots that say non-potable water. The spigots are actually physically separated by a uh, anti-backflow device that prevents water from coming back in to contaminate the water supply. That's what these devices are to the left. Those are anti-backflow devices. Fuel supply. Ideally, the ideal choice of fuel, the cleanest choice of fuel we have for running a greenhouse is natural gas. There are lots of different fuels, and we'll talk about different fuels when we talk about heating and heating greenhouses, but ideally natural gas. And to get natural gas, you need to be close by to a line, a water, uh, gas supply line where you can plumb into. If you don't have that, you're going to have to get propane. And Propane is a product of uh, the manufacture of gasoline. It comes from the cracking plant. It's one of the first steps is when they take the, the crack, when they crack the petroleum for making gasoline. Uh, propane is a byproduct, and that's what we burn in these sorts of systems. The trick is, is that propane has to be delivered to your greenhouse site on a truck, which means that truck needs to be able to cross the bridge, and you need to be able to have adequate supply to last you through the cold snap. Because never fails, that propane tank is going to run out at 6 o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day. And you try to get a propane truck driver out at 6 o'clock in the morning on a Christmas Day, 
you're going to pay for it. He's going to come, but you're going to pay for it. So make sure that you have an adequate supply of propane. And this propane tank uh, probably isn't legal at this particular site because it has no uh, protection, no uh, protection from a pickup truck or something like that or a tractor running into it. You'd like to see some concrete pillars around it. Yes, question. Have you ever seen methane digesters used to heat greenhouses? Have I ever seen a methane digester used for greenhouses? That's an interesting subject area. Um, I have never personally seen one. I know they exist. Uh, methane digesters use biofuels um, for um, generating uh, methane gas, uh, perhaps from animal waste, uh, other waste products such as that. Uh, I know they exist. That sounds like a good um, group study project for you to work on and present to the group. But methane digesters is probably a good um, potential s uh, source of fuel in the future. Um, one of the biggest sources of methane we have today is the off-gassing from abandoned landfills, or not abandoned, landfills that have been, uh, have been uh, retired and they're covered up. And as the organic mat matter in the landfill is generated, they have to off-vent that methane. And right now, they just gas it. They just flare it. And because methane is a uh, very significant um, part of uh, global warming. Uh, it's a, co a component of increasing global warming. So anything we can do to reduce the methane released in the atmosphere is a good thing. So um, there are people working in that area. Have I personally seen one? No. It's an interesting, th interesting thought, though. Other alternative sources of fuel that we'll talk about, we'll talk about wood, we'll talk about um, lots of different opportunities. And there's lots of different things that you can do to work in to uh, s offsetting your fuel costs. One thing that we need to talk a, a little bit about and spend some time on is on your property, how do you orient the greenhouse? Because this is something I get a question about all the time. And the orientation is dependent upon what we call the angle of incidence. And the angle of incidence is that angle that li of light striking a surface different from perpendicular. So for instance, if your roof is my hand and I'm making the time, time out symbol, that in perpendicular, the angle of incidence is zero. And throughout the year, that angle of incidence changes depending upon your latitude. So an angle of incidence of zero, or perpendicular, where the light wave is perpendicular, that's where you're going to get the most light entry into your greenhouse. Otherwise, you're going to have reflection. And reflected light is light that has been lost. It's lost that you can't use. So we need to make sure that we get the most light into our greenhouse as possible. And one of the ways we do that is by how do we orient our greenhouse. As a rule of thumb, we orient our greenhouses north, south, ridge lines. The ridge lines running north and south at 40 degrees latitude and south or lower. Okay? We orient our greenhouses east-west, the ridge line running east-west, north of 40 degrees latitude. Who knows or who can tell me, give me a point of reference in Colorado where the 40th parallel exists? Any map geeks? Baseline Road, exactly. Baseline Highway, Highway 7, and uh, that's exactly 40 degrees l north latitude. Okay. In Colorado, does it matter if we go north, south, east, west? Well, actually, we're so close to that number, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. It actually has more to do with how many greenhouses you're building. So, for instance, if you look at this table out of the book, uh, you can see that the percent transmission at 50 degrees north latitude, which is the Canadian border, and how it changes your percent transmission just because of the angle of declination alone. 
This graphic kind of tells you where the light goes. So light coming from the sun, we have a part that's reflected. Okay, That's direct light reflected off. We can't use it in our greenhouse. It's not going to give us any photosynthesis. We're going to have light that's absorbed by the glazing material. Glazing or glass or polycarbonate or polyethylene. I use the word glazing. That light is absorbed and re-radiated off as infrared energy or heat. And the light that goes through, we have direct transmission. We have some light that's filtered by the glazing. We have diffused transmission. And the diffuse transmission is one of those things that we want to take the most advantage of. How many have been sunburned on a cloudy day? Where were you when you were on a cloudy day? You were skiing, weren't you? Probably. That's because not only did you have the direct radiation, but you had the diffuse radiation that was diffused by the clouds. And if you were skiing, you also had the albedo Albedo is a fancy word for reflection or reflection off the snow, so you're getting a double dose of that energy. The diffuse transmission, diffuse light in a greenhouse is a good thing because light striking a surface area isn't always at a perfect zero angle of incidence. Try as we might, we cannot design a plant that grows leaves that all face the same way. They're all different kinds of angles. So the more diffuse light, the more light interception we have in our leaves. With the, it says that there's a 4.5 loss upon hitting the glazing, and then 4.5 exiting the glazing. That's a 9% loss of energy, right? It's a 9, okay, the 4.5% loss, that's reflected in general, and 4.5 is absorbed so it is a 9% loss of energy, yes. And the, more, the things that we can do by cho choosing our glazing material or how we manage our glazing material can make an impact of that light. Now in Colorado, we, have, uh, we, we, have, we enjoy high intensity light. And typically in Colorado, we're shading our greenhouses. But um, in other parts of the country where you may have a lot of uh, cloud cover or something like that, uh, glazing uh, quality gets to be really important. Question. Curved roof versus? Curved roof versus a straight roof. Yeah. Okay, one of the things about a curved roof is like a barrel vault or a, or a quonset is that curvature is going to adapt all year long to the changing angle of declination. With a curved roof, you also need to think about your purlins and your struts, how those are oriented to cast a shadow in the greenhouse. And we'll come to that in a minute. So a curved roof actually has some advantages when it comes to, the, comes to angle. So like I said, 40 degrees, above 40 degrees latitude, we run them east-west, okay? Multi-span houses, in other words, gutter connect, ridge and furrow, whatever you want to call them, we always orient those north and south. The idea is behind orienting north and south is that ridge line running the length of the greenhouse is moving, the shadow that it cast is moving all day long, never creating a shadow in the same point. So you have more universal, more uniform light. When you're north of 40 degrees latitude, you orient east-west because you're trying to accommodate for that low light level in the midwinter <coughs> and get the most direct light that we can get. So what happens is they sh the shadows actually move. Question. Sorry, back one slide. Um, is the diffuse light just as much important as the direct sunlight? Is the diffuse light just as important as the direct sunlight? I'm going to say yes. And the reason why I say yes is because the diffuse light actually gets into the plant canopy more effectively. Um, when we talk about glazing materials, we'll talk about light, diffusi light diffusion and how it increases photosynthesis because the light is coming from more different angles. You know, the photosynthesis is going to work the most efficiently when the light is perpendicular. And 
leaves are all different angles, and that way you get more uniform light. And with diffuse light, you get fewer shadows. Any photographers in the room? You ever use a diffusion filter to take the shadows out? That's the primary thing, OK? It's not just for the, uh, mo uh, the models walking down the runway, OK? So diffusion removes shadows as well. So here's a graphic looking at a angle of incidence at a high latitude where the angle of the sun is low. The, the angle between the red line and the yellow line, that is our angle of incidence. And when that light comes off, we have more reflection than if it was if it was coming in perpendicular. So by adjusting our orientation, we can reduce the level of reflection. <coughs> And of course, below, we, uh, the moving of the shadows is more important. But the thing is, is you always want to design for the extreme. Whether it's temperature, high temperature, low temperature, daylight, day length, always designed for the extreme, not the average. So here you can see at a low latitude, that angle of incidence is even less. <coughs> I spent a month in Colombia, which is the right pretty close to the equator, and they cannot fathom existing in a climate where the day length changes as much as it does in Colorado. I remember growing up in Montana, playing in the summertime. Our requirement was to come home when it got dark. Midsummer, 11 o'clock at night. Midwinter, we got on the buses in the dark, and we got home in the dark. So it's something you have to think about. So at the 49th parallel at the Canadian border, here you can see the angle of declination. And this is for a lean-to structure for a hobby greenhouse, for instance. I'm going to design that with an opaque roof that's perpendicular to my summer sun for cooling, because I don't need all that energy. And I'm going to design it have the most light transmission during the winter months. Where do you get these tables? Where do you get these data? You, the data comes from um, the easiest place to go are websites that uh, put out um, sun, moon, altitude, azimuth data. And I believe this website is the Department of Navy. So this website from the Department of Navy you enter in whether you want to look at the sun or the moon, uh, what day you want to see it. You can go back years if you want. And it'll give you give your state or your city or town, and it'll give you exact um, azimuth, the angle of declination of the sun or the moon at that particular time. Why is this important to the Navy? Do you realize in the Navy they still use sextants? My brother spent 17 years in the Navy, and he um, was in charge of the gyros and the sonars on the ship. And every time he had a full access to a cloudless sky, he was out calibrating his equipment with a sextant. So they still do it. Why do they need to know moon? Tides. So this is a really cool website. So how does this work out when we talk about greenhouses? This graphic on the left kind of gives you an idea of how the sun changes and how the shadows change. If you're a Google Earth geek, you can go in there and build yourself a building. And you can change the time of day, and you can watch the shadows on the building. Okay? If you go to Google Earth, Google Earth uh, right now, the um, they have put on uh, the new computer science building. CSU has put on uh, the computer science building. You can actually look at that at different times of the year and different times of day and look at the shadows on the computer science building over here across from Lori Student Center. And that's a good example how that works. If we have ten at the time at the end of class, we'll go do that. So a single house, you really have to pay attention. Small gutter connects, you need to think about how it's going to be oriented. 
The other thing you need to think about when you lay, lay out your greenhouse complex, where are the workers? Now we build a greenhouse primarily for growing plants. The greenhouse is not designed for human habitability. It's designed for plants. When we go on our tours, you'll find some of the greenhouses either being cold or hot, and they're not growing it for your comfort, they're growing it for the comfort of the plants. The other thing is, we need to locate our work areas where employees need to be in a central location. If we put the head house, workroom, and office area over here to the right or left side, that doubles the length of time it needs to take to go back and forth between greenhouse sections. A lot of our larger greenhouse properties that are 10, 20 acres in size, the growers actually ride bicycles in a greenhouse because we're not paying the people to walk from unit to unit. Or they'll use some sort of a device like that. So you want to make sure you cluster or cluster group your facilities, your utilities, so it's convenient for your employees. When you're locating a greenhouse, think about your ultimate size. First thing you'll discover when you build a greenhouse is it's too small. You always seem to need more. You also need to think about how's the product going to move through your greenhouse. Are you going to use carts? Are you going to use you need a pickup truck to drive in? You need to think about how wide the aisles need to be. We talk about benches and uh, beds. We'll talk about aisle width and how far we need to be. You need to think about how tall the ceilings need to be, how uh, high up the doors need to be for your carts passing through. Um, that's not all a standard uh, seven foot door. So you need to think about the height of the carts, passing carts, maybe pavement. Concrete is expensive. Maybe you just need to put concrete down for the pathways. Okay. So for instance, these are some examples of some shipping carts. These are being, uh, carts are being uh, towed into the loading dock area. This kind of cart, these are very specially designed carts. They're, they're, they're called uh, tracking carts. In other words, when, the, when you get 20 or 30 of these carts in a row and you turn, each cart turns at the same point. They're designed that way. But you need to make sure that you have an opening wide enough for the cart to pass. And also think about the height of the plants on the top of the cart. Um, a lot of greenhouses, that's how they stage their shipments, is on a cart. So you need to think about how wide does your pathway need to be for the cart. You need to think about what kind of equipment is going to pull the cart. These carts are actually amazingly simple. If, if you've got a nice level floor, uh, you can probably pull five carts by yourself. That's how easy they are to move. When you're laying out your property, think about how far your employees have to walk. Think about where you're going to put your areas for your greenhouses. Uh, we're moving away from greenhouses that are physically separate. We're actually moving and migrating together as gutter connect because we find it's more efficient to not have that extra wall exposed for uh, energy. Think about how the pathways need to be laid out. When we talk about benches and designs, we'll, s we'll see that crops like tomatoes and roses and carnations, we typically have long linear rows. But crops such as that are in pots and flats, we use perpendicular rows. For instance, these are best laid out north to south because we get the moving of the sun in our service areas, make the bench the, the beds parallel to the ridge line. And when a harvesting crew walks between the rows, it's easier for them to work from end to end, bringing their produce or their flowers back to one side to a bucket or a sling or a container. When you're working with potted materials, it's much more efficient to have a wider walkway down the middle that you can pass a cart through with peninsular benches. And the idea here is, is that if a worker needs to get here to here, one side of the greenhouse to the other, they don't have to walk one end of the greenhouse and all the way around. So think about the efficiency and how many steps it takes to move from point A to point B. One of the slickest things I've ever seen for somebody to evaluate 
how much walking an employee has to do in their greenhouse is to make you put a layout out, get a bunch of pins, stick pins, stick them in the paper, and tie a string to it and see how long the string is. Pretty high tech, huh? But that's the most efficient way to determine the, from point A to point B, how long does it take you? Because you're not paying your employees to walk, you're paying your employees to water plants, scout, and take care of your crop. So one of the things we use are monorails. Monorails reduce the width of the aisleways because we're putting the delivery device over the crop. Um, and it helps quite a bit. This is actually a motorized monorail. This is a, a monorail. This is actually at gully greenhouses. And one person can move four shelves of plants anywhere in the greenhouse by themselves. Yeah. How many flats of bedding plants can you carry? I can carry five and not stack them. Okay. I can't do it all day long because I'll be tired. That's a whole lot easier. Here's an example of a monorail system being used in a tissue culture operation. This is AgriStarts in Florida. And what these people are doing is they're transplanting tissue culture foliage plants into their trays and putting them on the monorail. The, ideal here, the idea here is that the employees are working in an air-conditioned environment. It's pleasant. They have a nice chair. They're not standing in water. And when they get done, all those plants go right out to the greenhouse. This is an example of using conveyor belts. This is, a, this is the staging area in a bedding plant operation. And what they do every day is when the uh, workers go out and pick an order, or pick orders for the day, they go and pull their bedding plants, and they put them on these slope benches. You can see we have all the yellow petunias here and um, white stuff over here and so forth and so forth. And those are all ready to go. And when they're processing the carts, the workers then pull the flats that need to go there, put them on the conveyor, go down to the end, and they're loaded onto those carts. So again, think about how you want to stage your crops. Conveyors are probably one of the things that greenhouses use the most. They're expensive. Uh, different kinds of conveyors. Here we have in the lower right-hand corner a very sophisticated Dutch system that's all automated. Um, the top left-hand corner, we have benches that are uh, conveyors that are portable. Sometimes you just need to have one or two con bench conveyors that you can just move from section to section to section. What we're doing with conveyors, any kind of conveyance system, is cutting down the number of steps an employee needs to take. I think this will, this is a conveyor system. This is a Visser system that's made in Holland. And it's not going to work. Other kinds of conveyance systems. This is a conveyor. Uh, this is at Optimera Greenhouses outside of Nashville. Optimera is uh, the largest African violet grower in the United States, um, where the conveyor brings the plants through this tunnel. And the tunnel has got lights and, and cameras that decide how big the plant is, decide uh, if it's got blooms on it, what color the bloom is, and moves it out uh, through another series of conveyors where it can make a decision or it's programmed to run on different tracks to go to different parts of the greenhouse. So this is a, can be used for different kinds of automation systems. Here's an example of a greenhouse in Alabama where they just have simple benches. These are benches built out of two by fours with, uh, with um, fence material. And they have interlocking 
uh, conveyor, or these are uh, roller wheels that they put down, and they're able to roll the flats down the row until they fill up the bench, and that saves the people from having to walk the length of the greenhouse. And if you look on the left-hand side, you can see this section of conveyor has been pulled out. They'll pull out the next section, the next section, the next section, and that way it's, it's a faster way to build a greenhouse. So one of the biggest things we need to do in a greenhouse is save labor. The two most expensive parts of greenhouse operation are fuel and labor. Here's that conveyor system my slides got out of sort. This is the African violet system where it's coming out of the conveyor and you can see it's got little levers and kickers to move the plants to the right table. Automation is one of the things that saves the industry. The, the more automation you can invest in, the more efficient you'll be. Now, not everybody investigate, invests in automation because they have a diver, more diverse or perhaps labor is cheaper than the investment. I've got a real treat for you today. I'm standing in Holt Camp Greenhouses, who are the producers of Optimara African Violets. And I'm in their R&D greenhouse right now, which is you're looking at some of the new cutting edge violets that they breed here. African violets are the most popular houseplant in the world. They estimate that at least 100 million are sold every year. That's a lot of plants. And right here, just outside of downtown Nashville, is 10 acres of cutting edge, center of the African violet universe, breeding and production here at Optimara. It's amazing. It's a really beautiful place. It's been here since 1977, and they have been doing state-of-the-art production ever since. Even if you... it'll come back. Aren't a big African violet aficionado. You've seen Optimara violets everywhere they sell houseplants, whether it's a big box retailer or a high-end florist. They're everywhere. But it takes a lot of work to get them to that state. I want to show you today how long and what, what kind of effort it takes to bring those beautiful plants to the store ready for you to buy, to burst into bloom into your home. Let's go see how, just how they do that. Like I'm here in the propagation the greenhouse at Holt Camp where the Optimara violets get their start. Every house. violet you buy is a clone, meaning a vegetatively propagated baby off a mother plant. And we're here to find out just how that happens. And I'm talking to Monique Holt Camp, third generation Holt Camp plant breeder and propagator. And Monique, I'd love for you to tell us exactly what we're seeing right here. Okay. Well, this is the beginning of a new plant. And what Con is doing, who has worked for us for many years, is she is putting the um, mother leaves into soil out of which babies will grow. I see. And how many babies, would, uh, what do you expect to see getting off of one leaf? About one baby per leaf. Okay. And how long does it take for a leaf to start growing babies? Until babies come, it's 16 weeks. 16 weeks. And then they have to get, that's tiny though, they start really small, right? Yes, that's a tiny baby. How long does it take from this little beginning to get a plant that you're ready to ship out? It takes about 34 weeks. Wow. So that's almost eight and a half months from this leaf to the finished plant that you buy in the store. How about that? That's longer than people expect, I think. I think so. Yeah. Boy, they're a good buy. They're sorted by size. Uh, um, as, they, as they pop them off the leaves, they, the, they sort it into large, medium, and small. And they will be planted according to size because they will mature at different rates. And you don't want to have, you want to have a crop come into its maturity at the exact same time. Every pot should look as much alike as possible. And that process starts here. Once those little babies get big enough, they're transplanted. And you can see it's broken off here. A few little hair 
roots there, just getting going. And it'll be every one of these babies, and you can see there are masses of them, will be stuck by variety into this plug tray. This is an 84 cell plug tray. And they do massive amounts of these. Monique, how many a week does Hope Camp stick? Well, here in Nashville, over 60,000 a week. Wow. And um, in all our operations in South America, Asia, and Africa, over 100,000 a week. That's a lot so. of violence. A lot of work. Once those little babies grow on in that plug tray and get a really good root system going on them, they're ready to move on. And what's happening here is they are getting potted on into their final home. These are four inch pots. And you can see it's a highly mechanized system. This system and these ladies can do up to 30,000 a day. That's a lot of plants. From here, they go into a greenhouse where they're grown from eight to 12 weeks. Time depends on variety. And they're considered, by that time, they're finished. They have blooms coming on. They're ready to package and ship out to the retailer. Monique, tell me what's happening here. Well, here we just, they have collected the different colors in trays, and they are, um, on the belt, they are putting them in the sleeves. I see, those plastic sleeves that right, they ship in. Right, right, to make sure that they don't break. And from there, they will go into the boxes and out into the trucks. And this is what you buy at the store. That's and this right. is 34 weeks. Exactly. 34 weeks later, folks. It's a wonderful process. We've seen. I chose that video to show you a little bit about um, how plants are moved in a greenhouse. So when you're thinking about locating a greenhouse and you're designing a greenhouse layout, to think about how plants move throughout the greenhouse. They use a rooting hole? Absolutely. So this is a little video on hanging baskets or another thing to think about how we lay them out. And uh, a lot of times we can use our space for greenhouses um, more efficiently by bringing the hanging baskets to the irrigation system. And you can see the water squirting into each pot. It's a timed system. This is called ecosystem. Anybody? Can you think of a, of a product that looks similar to this in the state of Colorado? Maybe a chairlift? And these ecosystems are actually built here in uh, Colorado. And I have one of their videos loaded up for you. I didn't choose the music. So the critical thing to think about is
What else does the Echo save you from doing? Well, like you said, everything is controlled here from a central location. So I can water everything right here. I can also allow the plant time to drip here at this location instead of over top the other plants in the bed. How does it know how to water it then? I mean, well, this switch up here, when it's depressed, it turns on these two laser eyes. And if there is a basket on the upper level, it's obviously going to turn on the upper solenoid. If there's a basket on the lower level, same thing. If there's no basket there, eye's not going to read anything, it's not going to turn on water. Now, how does it know how much water to water it, though? Well, Cherry Creek's in the process of making a patented weighing system that will water by weight. So if a basket is wet, it's obviously going to weigh a lot not going to water that basket. If it's dry, it's got to turn on the water and wet. What I'm noticing is a lot of different size baskets here. What does the echo system do to help us adapt to those different size plant containers? Well, this valve right here, I can adjust however much water I want to put on each basket when it's stopping and getting watered. Also, I'm sure you noticed with the big baskets, there's a lot of foliage. And this water breaker, the water would just run right off onto the ground and wouldn't get the plant wet. Well, that's really easy fixable. I can just pop this water breaker off, and we can just get a stream of water to blow right past the foliage, and what do you plant as you need it? is that we can bring the plants uh, in and out of the work area. The workers are inside an air-conditioned and climate-controlled area. They're not working in the greenhouses, and they move down these trolley systems, and they move into the greenhouse, and they'll progress across the greenhouse over time so that when they're at the other end of the greenhouse, they're mature and ready to be pulled off and harvested in another way. Um, a lot of the uh, moving tabletops are designed so they can they come in and we can use them on equipment that loads and offloads the benches and uh, cuts down labor here. So here's an example of, of a moving tabletop. Chris Beatty's is with Ball Publishing, and he's kind of a goofball. Welcome to Ubik Nursery in Kudelstart near Amsterdam. Owned by Edwin Eubank and his brothers Hert and John, Ubik produces millions of cactus and succulents in 600,000 square feet of state-of-the-art greenhouses. Now, with that many plants, efficient internal transportation is key, and they've recently installed a new development from Logix Agro that helps them move more product through the greenhouse even more efficiently than before. To speed things up, Logix has developed these shuttles, which are small, wireless, wheeled robots. A pair of them sits on the transport cart and then rolls down each bay on top of the heat pipes, pushing and pulling tables in and out of the bays to and from the transport cart, which moves the tables from one bay to the next. Now standard Dutch internal transport systems would use either a cable drive system or a ratcheting sawtooth kind of a system to move the tables onto the transport cart. These shuttles eliminate that. Now it's riding down on the heat pipes. It'll extend a little device here that grabs the bottom of the table. Then it'll reverse and pull the table back to the transport cart. Once it reaches the end of the line, the transport cart knows that the shuttle is there, sends out its bridges, and moves the table over onto the transport cart.
Now that's all well and good, but this is where it gets really cool. While the transport cart is taking this first table down to its new section, the shuttle can head back out into the bay to retrieve another table. Now, the transport cart has reached the new bay. It's already put the second shuttle out into that bay, and that second shuttle is now going to take this first table out into its new location. All of this table motion is controlled by a computer program. The grower goes in and tells the computer what tables it wants moved where, and the robots handle the rest. Here's our first shuttle having retrieved its second bench now, and it's sitting here ready to go for when the transport cart comes back. Here it comes. Table number two will get transferred. shuttle will head back out to keep working. So there you have it. Logic Agro's new shuttle system designed to make already efficient internal bench systems even more efficient. Greenhouse takes four or five people to um, in, in Europe to run where that same greenhouse in the United States would take 30 to 40 people to run. So uh, what they're doing is uh, they're offsetting their labor with, with uh, technology. What happens when the system breaks down? Well, uh, you have a staff that knows how to fix it, hopefully. Uh, the biggest thing to, make sh to keep up with these systems is to keep the electric eyes pointed in the right direction. When we tour greenhouses here in Colorado, you'll see a lot of Dutch transplanters. When those pla transplanters break down, they have to fly in a technician, usually from Holland, to fix it. Here's another little quick video. <coughs> this one isn't quite, this one's more common. operation in New Mexico. Which you can find for free. If you put a YouTube video out and you put music on it, they have robots to go through and evaluate the music send you a message that you violated somebody's copyright.
last thing you need to think about when you're laying out your greenhouse is think about the service buildings. You've got to have service buildings. You've got to have places for your employees. You have to have product packaging places. You have to have state areas to stage your shipments. Um, you don't want to use greenhouse space for storage. You don't want to use greenhouse space for break room areas. You have to think about uh, your loading docks. You have to think about these sorts of things. You need to think about pesticide storage. I don't care if you're talking about conventional or organic pesticides. They all require the same amount, same storage facilities. Pesticides are never to be stored with fertilizers. So they need to be separate. So you have to have a fertilizer storage area. You're probably going to require to have certain code restrictions for herbic uh, pesticides and certain code restrictions for fertilizers. A lot of our fertilizers are oxidizers. We can't buy ammonium nitrate anymore, but you still have some o heavy oxidizers that could be considered explosive. You need to have adequate storage areas. Uh, some people <coughs> store their product, store their supplies at the warehouse of their supplier and not at their own place, but that assumes that you can get a truck there anytime you want. You have to have storage area maybe for a boiler room. If you're using a boiler, a central boiler system, you don't want to have the boiler in the greenhouse because boilers and greenhouse environment don't go together well. So. So here's an example. This is a pesticide room in a greenhouse. And actually what they've done is they've taken, created their pesticide storage facilities is out of a, an old semi-tractor trailer box that was no longer roadworthy. And they converted that into their storage unit. Soil mixing. If you mix your own potting soil, you need to have, uh, think into your layout where you're going to have your potting soil uh, mixing facility. Are you, you're going to have, you have to have storage areas. If you're shipping into um, places uh, th that have uh, quarantines, like for instance, the, uh, the elm bark beetle, uh, if you want to ship into the West Coast, you have to have storage facilities that are screened to meet the quarantine restrictions. So you need to think about what kind of space you need for storage. And here's a picture of a soil mixing line. Uh, this is a Bolden Lawson company out of McMinnville, Tennessee. And it ain't going to play. I'll give you the link later. <coughs> Think about your loading docks. You need to have access for your tractor trailers to come in and out. Uh, tractor trailers need a turning radius. Uh, these tractor trailer drivers are pretty good at getting in crazy places, but one of the things that you want to be able to do is make sure you can get in and out. Employee facilities, break room, lavatories, workshop to r for your work, for your repair crews to, to fix things. Your physical plant includes your water treatment, your boiler, your heating plant, such as that, storage facilities, etc. These are all things you need to think about when you're building a greenhouse and laying out your property.